Welcome everybody. I hope you had a chance to get some pizza and something to drink for hustling down here. Uh, my name is Marshall Clow. Uh, I work for Qualcomm down in San Diego and I'm going to be talking about fun with tuples. Um, first definition. What do I mean by fun? I mean we're going to talk a little bit about tuples, you know, where, the, where maybe where they came from, what their basic operations are, what, you, what, the, what the standard says you can do with them, and then we're going to kind of branch off into interesting things that I've discovered about tuples. Things that I think are unusual about them. Things that are made me scratch my head. Um, there's not really going to be a lot of emphasis on usability or practicality or anything. Just kind of interesting things. Um, there will be things here that I think that people will use, but I didn't go out of my way to, to emphasize those things. Okay, anytime if you have a question, just put your hand up, let me know, and I will endeavor to answer it. Um, occasionally, if, if someone asks a question, I will may say, you know, hold that slot, because I have a slide coming up on it. But in general, I'll try to answer them right away. So what the heck is a tuple? I like to think that a tuple started with somebody on the standards committee with a completeness fetish. They looked at standard pair and said, huh, this is all nice, but what's so special about two? And I mean, if you, if you have known anybody who's, who's on the C++ standards committee, many of them have completeness fetishes. It's like, generalize this and make it just, you know, no arbitrary limitations. Um, it's a generalized statement of standard pair. Instead of having two elements named first and second, you can have as many elements as you want up to some compiler-defined implementation limit which may be a thousand or more. Um, sadly, in tuple, we don't have names for the fields. Um, I thought it would be pretty cool to have names like 19th and 537th. <laughs> Sebastian says, come to his talk, which is in this room, right after mine, where he will show you how to overload the dot operator and be able to give names to fields on tuples. 537th. I like it. Although, you know, after a while this gets a little longer to type. So, first just kind of general question. What's the difference between a, a tuple with, say, an int and a float and a string and a struct with an int and a float and a string? Um, first one, obviously, field names. There's no field names in a tuple, because I touched on that before. Um, but a, a more subtle one is layout. In a struct, you have some control on how the fields are laid out in memory. In a tuple, you have no such guarantees at all. You have, um, I think that most tuple, most compilers, wow, most tuples, Many compilers will lay the fields out in the order in which you declare them, but there's at least one compiler that lays them out in reverse order. It all depends on how the compiler does it. And in fact, there are some... Excuse me, I was being imprecise. Standard library implementations, not compilers. Okay, the, the, the compiler doesn't know anything really about tuples. It's a standard library implementation. Some standard library implementations lay them out front to back, otherwise back to front. Um, at least one... Um, standard library implementation lays the fields out in an arbitrary order designed to reduce the amount of unused space in, in the uh, struct that it creates. So if you had, say, care, int, float, care, it might put the two cares together so they would fit into a 16-bit, um, six, take up 16 bits in memory instead of being a lot, each one aligned to a 4-byte boundary. But there's really no, um, what's a good way to put it? There's no guarantees about any of that. Um, obviously, if you do that kind of stuff, then you have to have some kind of logic in the tuple to say, when you say get three, to know that it's not really the third structure in memory, but there's a level of indirection there. Um, any other things people can think of? This is, this is going to be kind of an interactive talk, so I, I will ask questions of the audience, too. Anybody else want to think of differences between a, a tuple containing three elements and a struct containing the same three? Steven, in the back. 
if you make two tuples two, two with the same elements, they're the same type. If you create two structs with the same elements, they're not. A good example. They may be laid out exactly the same, but they're not the same type, right? All tuples, all three element tuples where the first the first element, the you know, the first all tuples of type of int float stud string are all the same type. Anybody else? Okay. So basic operations on a tuple. What can you do with a tuple? Um, you can get elements from the tuple. Okay, you can use. There's a specialization of std get. Um, you pass a tuple to it. You pass the index of the of the element you want, and you get it back. Note that n is a is a template parameter, which means what? You can't use a variable. You have to use a compile time constant there. Um, and in fact, this is a const expr function. Um, tuple element. Same thing, and a tuple gives you back a type. This is a this is a type function. It returns the type of the nth element. Yes. Is get n const expert in C plus plus eleven or fourteen? Eleven. Okay. Ah, thank you. Yes, I do need to repeat the questions. Um, the question was: Is standard get const expert in C plus plus eleven or fourteen? Yes, into both. In both. Um, tuple size tells you how many elements there are in a tuple. Um, also, const expr. Really, this is this should be just a type, but we don't. You know, it's it's it takes a tuple, um, and you can compare them. There are a full set of relational operators on a tuple. Um, equality, not equality, less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal, and so on. Um, and we'll see something about that later. And that's pretty much the list of things that you can do with a tuple. Um, swap. You can swap them. I forgot swap. So, yes? Um, the question is, can you, um, does this mean you can't put something in a tuple that is not comparable? Wow, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I suspect what it means is that if you put something like that into a tuple, you can't actually compare them. But I, I don't know. It's right. a template member function, so just unless you use it, it won't be instantiated. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Do you have a hand up or are you just stretching? What? Could you repeat that? Ah, yes. So Rob, what Rob said was that it's a template member function, and so if you don't use it, it shouldn't be instantiated. Of course. Don't using it, you know, if you call something like sort or something, you know, you're using it implicitly. Okay, um, other things. How do I make a tuple? I mean, how do I make a tuple? Well, you know, you can just declare one, use brace initialization to, um, to make it. Um, in general, I tend to avoid brace initialization because for some reason, I end up repeating the, the types a lot. Um, and brace initialization also has narrowing provisions. You can't narrow it. And so I have to, since I have a float here, I have, this won't actually work. Slideware, slideware, 2.78F. I need an F there. Because otherwise, it will fail to compile and say, you know, it, this is a narrowing conversion. So it's much better to use make tuple. Make tuple, well, um, you, can, you can put the type, the, the list of types in here if you wish, or not. Um, in this case, I remembered the f. So I'm going to get int float string back out. In this case, if I left the f out, this wouldn't compile again, because although make tuple would happily make a, um, it would work, sorry. It would work. We'll talk about that in just a second. If I left the f out here, make tuple would create a tuple of int double string. And when it went to move it into here, well, the assignment and, uh, and move constructors and operators for tuple will do conversions on each element. So it's basically it's doing an assignment or a move from each element. So you get, you know, you get the conversion. Machinery in, brought into play. 
And couldn't you solve that with auto? Certainly you can solve that with auto. You could just say auto t2 equal um, make, tuple make tuple, and then you get a tuple of float, int float string here. Yes, auto is your friend in C++11, and, and when dealing with tuples very frequently is your friend. Um, and besides make tuple, there's this really interesting thing called tuple cat. That tuple cat takes a sequence of tuples. It's a very added template. It takes an unknown, an unknown number, sequences of tuples or pairs, or probably STD arrays, since STD get works on arrays as well, and bursts them. And basically hands you back another tuple that contains all of the elements of the first tuple followed by all the elements of the second tuple followed by up, 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 all the way across. And so this tuple cat, I take a pair of what? Int float and a tuple that contains a single element of a string, concatenate them together, get a single tuple out again of this same type. Everybody happy with that? I'm seeing a couple of people looking kind of. You said of the same type um, as which? The same. I get a I get a tuple of type int float string because the pair was int float, okay. and the tu this this second tuple parameter was string. Okay, that the elements of the things I passed to tuple cat were int float string, and so I got back a tuple of int float string. Back there. So you don't have to pass in all of the elements and make tuple. So if you just find a string, what happens to the in float when it makes the tuple? I'm sorry. I right there when you have make tuple when you pass in a string. Mm -hmm. You didn't pass in the int and a float in the make tuple. What does it no? Down here. Yeah, right. Okay, make tuple takes a list of values and makes a tuple out of those list of values. This, in this case here, okay, the question was, I didn't pass an int and a float to make tuple here. So I passed just a single value, which was a string. So it made a tuple that contained one value, just a string. And that tuple was not of type tuple. It was of type std tuple string. So you can have any or all of the values? Right. Each, a, a tuple is a template. and and it when you instantiate the template, it declares a type. And that each type is different depending on what kind of types it holds. So this one, in my example, I have th it has three elements. The first is an int, the second is a float, the, th the third is a string. But the thing that's returned from this call, make tuple string hi mom, is a tuple that contains one element, just a string. And then when I concatenate that with this pair that contains an int and a float, I get a three element tuple that contains an int, a float, and a string, which matches what I tried to assign it to. Stephen. I just checked tuple cat. According to tuple.creation, it only takes tuples. So make pair will not work? Um, interesting. OK. Then apparently libc++ has a conforming extension where it takes pairs and, and arrays. But um, the question, the comment from Stephen was, he just tried it, and um, it worked. did you look it up somewhere? Or you I just looked it up in the spec. Okay, he looked it up in the spec, and tuplecat only takes tuples, and so a a strict interpretation of that would this would not work. I could change this to make tuple, and then it would work. Um, Jeff, back it back. Uh, my suspicion is that it's probably working because pair is probably implemented as a tuple. Okay, that's that's another that's another possibility. His comment was, uh, it's probably working because pair is implemented as a two-element tuple in the library. So going so, back to my earlier question, uh, uh -huh. const expo. I mean, those who have the uh, the draft up right now, maybe can look up if get is const expo or not. Because when I checked last time, it wasn't. That's why I kind of trying to verify. Okay, I. When I checked this morning, I was looking at 3485, I think, which was was the current draft standard until yesterday. Um, <laughs> so 
3485? No, 3485. Uh, shouldn't be looking at the draft the day, uh, before C11 was published? No, you should, um, if you want to, um, um, probably a good idea to look at, at the C++, you know, the FDIS, which was what, 3290? Something, or 3216, I think it was. Um, I have it on my machine, we can look it up afterwards, okay? Come, come find me after the end. The question, the question was, um, he, um, he was not sure whether or not uh, the const expert, uh, of get was const expert as, when C++11 was ratified. So I've got it here in, in the F this, mm -hmm. at least it's not conflict. Okay, there we go. In the, in the final draft, international standard, which was right before adoption, uh, standard get was not context. So, okay, I was wrong. Thank you. Okay, fun stuff. STD tie. Um, STD tie, take, you, 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 it's a function, you give it a list of values. A li okay, a list of L values. And it creates a tuple that contains L value references. I did spell that right, okay. Um, the poster child f for usage of standard tie is you're inserting a value into a, an STD map or an STD set or something like that, a set I guess it is, and you wanna know you don't really care about where it went into the set. You just want to know whether it was there before. Okay, well, set insert returns a pair, iterator, and bool. And so what you can say is, you can say tie std ignore comma the boolean you, that you want equals set insert blah 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 blah. And what it'll do is it will um, it will take the pair and bust it into std ignore and your boolean. But std ignore is this thing that says I don't really care. I don't want this value at all. The 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 language in the um, in the standard says it's this thing for which yeah an object of unspecified type that any value can be assigned to with no effects. Now that's kind of weird. But the other thing is it's, it's just generally really useful for um, functions. You have functions that return multiple values. You know, I like to write code in a functional programming style. I'm not a, a full on functional programming guy, but one of the things I like to do is I like to write what people call pure functions. Takes in parameters as inputs, returns values as, out, as results. Um, and the parameters are not changed. And you know, that's kind of hard when you want to return more than one thing. Now some people would argue that, well then, you're not programming in a functional style if you, only, if you want to return multiple things, but okay. Um, anyway, you can return them into a tuple, and your callers can use tie to burst them into a set of variables. So in this case, tuple is just a delivery me mechanism for returning several values out of a function. So, have some code here. So we have a two, a two, we make a tuple again. This one is int float string, or int double string, because I didn't put the f on. But I'm using auto, so that's okay. And then I can so say tie i ignore ignore equals two, so I assigning the contents of tuple back into this tuple that Ty just, contained, just created. And when I do this, i is now three, because it's set getting the first value, and the first value of tuple was three. If I wanted all three values out of the tuple, I could just say, I could have said i equals std get zero, of tuple. That's, that's basically the same thing as this. But if you want to, this is a nice shorthand way of getting more than one value out at once. But anyway, fun. Things you can do with, with, with standard ignore, since you can assign anything to it. 
I can assign an int to it. I can assign a tuple to it. String, I can assign it to itself. I can create another thing of the same type and, and um, assign ignore to it. And then assign things to this thing I just created. What's the type of dev null here? It's unspecified. I don't know. The, the standard specifically says it's an unspecified type. But auto doesn't care. I don't know. Auto doesn't know anything about the standard. It just says it's the same type as that. Now, the only use for this that I've been able to come up with is if you're writing some code and your compiler is nagging about you because you have this variable you're not using. But you are actually using it. It's just the compiler is wrong. <laughs> and Sebastian's going to laugh and laugh. Assign it to STD ignore. The compiler will stop complaining about it because you assigned it somewhere. But assigning it to STD ignore doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't cause any side effects. Shouldn't generate any code. And the new compiler that generated the new warning, right? Assign and now unused. What? The new one's, uh, and now okay. Um, <laughs> you know what the funny thing is about that about that sign is you put it up and I get gl all I see is glare, but I know what it says. <laughs> the the comment was um, that maybe then the compiler would say, well, std ignore is unused, but std ignore is a global variable in the standard library. Um, so I don't think it'll complain about that. But yeah, assign things to std ignore because. It's not a global, it's in the STD names. It's a global. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, it has global lifetime. Um, yeah, you, you want to argue s syntax, and I want to argue, uh, argue lifetimes. Anyway, um, comparing tuples. Operator equal for a tuple is defined as. Is the first element the same? Is the second element the same? Is the third element the same? It should be 0, 1, 2, what, whatever. It basically compares, does, does member-wise comparison. And you know, it's short circuit. As soon as it finds one that's not equal, it says, I'm done. Um, the relational operators are defined the exact same way. This is called the lexicographic compare. Um, <coughs> cool thing. You can use this to compare structs. I've got a question. Yes? Uh, is the order in which the elements are compared uh, well defined? Or is that up to the standard or the implementation? Zero, one, two, I believe. The question was, is, is the order in which they are compared well defined? And I believe it is. It's zero, one, two, increasing index. Stop. So if you have tuples that are different types, uh -huh. can you still, let's, let's say that we have one that's an int float and a string, and another one that's an int and a double and a string. Can you still compare them? Oh, now that's a great question. The question is, if you have tuples that are different types, but the individual members are comparable, can you still compare them? And Sebastian is nodding his head, yes, I don't know. Yes. And Stephen says yes. Well, when, I have this back right in front of me. Yeah. OK, when, when, <laughs> let's put it this way. When Sebastian and Stephen agree, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm willing to take it to the bank. <laughs> Okay, but you can use you can use tie to compare structs. Okay, I got two, I got a struct here, int float string, right? Bracket initialization. We're, we're C plus plus eleven, right? Okay, great. I could say tie ifs ifs are they equal? Hey, they're equal, or they're not. How about this? If if they are this this says they are equal. So this comparison is true. This one's false because hi and mom are not the same. But this one only compares the first two fields. Um, you want to do lexicographic compare? Here's one that says we compare i's, then f's, then s's. But you say, no, 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 no. It's the string that's the most important thing. If the strings are different, um, that's what I want to check first. Well, fine. 1s, 1f, 1i, s, f, i. You can choose the order that, you compare, that you're comparing. This is a, a great little shortcut when you don't want to actually write up a whole comparison function. Because this does exactly what you want. Now, if you have more complicated logic when you have to compare different things and you, you, know, you want to worry about 
some other things or, in, or in, enforce invariance or something like that or check invariance in there, this isn't going to work for you. Okay? But I think this is pretty cool. It's just like you can compare arbitrary structs with tie. Now the interesting question, hmm, something that just occurred to me, what if you put an STD ignore in here? How does that affect the comparison? I mean, you wouldn't actually do that. It doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, you know, but how, I wonder how ignores compare. Does ignore compare equal to itself? What if you have two variables of that type? I don't know. Sebastian. Yes, <laughs> it just might not compile. It might not compile. Yeah. If there's no comparison operators defined on, to, on whatever type STD ignore is, it might not compile. Um, it was just a thought. It's like, you know, no, I can't see any use for it at all. But it's one of those things. That's true. Yes. So the, will the like, lexicographical compare handle different sizes? Um, not as far as I know. I, the question was, will the lexicographical compare handle different sizes of tuples? Because as we discussed earlier, you can compare tuples of different types, but <coughs> don't know. I'm going to write that one down so I don't forget it. could do that too. You could you could make a temporary using tie that is the size of the smaller one. Um, remember that tie creates a tuple full of references, so it doesn't actually copy the values, which is what you want. Um, oh, the standard says that for comparison they have to be the same size. Okay, there you go then. We also mentioned that the only discussion of ignore in the standard is specifically with use in tie. Yes. It doesn't suggest in any way any other usage outside of tie would work. So your fun with ignore, while well, fun may not actually be important. Rob's comment was the only mention of tie in the uh, in or ignore in the standard, and it's not in the index by the way. Okay. I, I opened a defect on that yesterday. Neither is tie. Um, uh, the only mention of ignore in the standard is specifically talking about tie. And so um, it's not really specified what, what, ha what happens if you use um, tie outside of, or ignore outside of a tie expression. On the other hand, you, you can think of how you would implement STD ignore. You'd make, it, make an object that has nothing and um, you know, has no member, a struct that has no members and it has a templated assignment operator will, that takes anything and just return, the code is return star this. Well, I could go crazy and instead make ignore some marker type and then specialize tuple assignment to say, okay, and if this is ignore, don't assign that sub element. Sebastian's going nuts here. He's, he says he's going. He's, he could. He could, in fact, envision a, a implementation of STD ignore that um, that would not work outside of tie. And I agree, you could. But why would you? Why would you? People who write standard libraries tend to be solved. Next problem. Stephen in the back. Boost ignore is a function which is detected and turned into something else. Boost ignore is a function that is detected and turned into something else. I'm not sure what you mean by detected and so turned into... when you tie it, it says, oh, this is, this is ignore. I'm going to turn it into something that can be assigned to when I actually create the tuple. Oh, okay. So you don't create global static objects. Okay, so, so boost in, in boost tuple, the, the analog of ignore there is, is something special. That, so this stuff would not work with boost tuple and boost ignore. Because they don't want to create a global variable, even one of zero size. OK. So I have a question for the audience. Is STD tuple a container? Is it an STL container? 
I see a hand back there. Michael. I shouldn't answer. What? I shouldn't answer. You shouldn't answer. OK. Anybody else want to try? Yes. No. no. OK. That's certainly one of the two answers. Yes. <laughs> Ray says yes. OK, good. Now we're going to have a cage match. We're going to put you two guys over here in the corner. And that's fine. Um, so the answer is, from, from my point of view, is, is that both of you are right. Um, the elements in a tuple can be heterogeneous. They can, be, they can differ, which is completely different than any other thing that we call a container in the STL. You know, they're all the same type. Now we fudge that with you know, any and variant and, and playing games with type erasure. But in general, they have to all be the same size. This, excuse me, the same type. And so tuple does not do that. But mm, at compile time, at compile time, a tuple is a container of types. It's it's a and we have we can index it. And we can manipulate it. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here for a second. Who remembers this book? <laughs> Who remembers this book? How many people read it when it first came out and then watched their brains kind of explode all over the page and go, oh, geez. And then go back and read it again, trying to understand what Andre was actually trying to say. Um, so in this book, Andre Alexandrescu spends a few chapters building up a facility for manipulating lists of types. And then he uses these type lists pretty much everywhere in the rest of the book to do policy-based smart pointers and factory functions and a whole bunch of cool things. Okay? My, I submit to you that a tuple is a type list. It does some other things, but it is a type list. And then we go back to, to this interesting question here. Standard tuple, int, const, care, void. Is this legal? Anybody want to get, take a shot at that? Yes. Yes, as long as you never instantiate, never declare a variable of tuple. Absolutely correct. He said, yes, it's legal as long as you never instantiate a variable of this type. Um, but you know what? This is a, this is a compile time container with three elements. The first one is int, the second one is const care star, the third one is void. Three types. And you can, you can do things with this at compile time. And yes, you did definitely, you know, if, if you have this book, um, you should go back and, and, and read it again. I suspect you will find it much more approachable than you did in, say, 2004 when it came out. Um, 2003. But, um, you know, anywhere he says type list, just think tuple. And I, I, I found it much easier to go through again. Um, partially it's because I've had several more years of experience and dealt with some of the things in there. Um, most of it was very new in 2003. But yes, this, this is a perfectly fine type. It's a perfectly fine compile time container. Um, Dietmar Kuhl, I don't know if any of you know him, works at Bloomberg, works with John Lakos and Alistair, who are here, has implemented a set of compile time functions that let you iterate over the types in a tuple, in a type list. Um, and so you can write compile time programs to manipulate um, the elements of a tuple. You have a question in the back. Could you pass that for like a in, in like a deco type uh, tuple cat to like say you wanted to like append to it and you do if the problem is if you want to do it the question is can you pass this as like as, as something you know deco type to tuple cat the problem with that is that to do that if you wanted to append to something like this or append this to something you'd have to instantiate it and yeah you were you were correct the first time you can't instantiate it Decal, decal type, you probably can. Um, it's not but, 
Right, inside decal type, you can, you can do some things inside decal type with this, but once you pass it to tuplecat, it's going to want to make a variable of that type. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, tuple is this really interesting data type, but because it's, use, it's very useful at both compile time and runtime. Um, but things like this are compile time only because it has void. Any questions about type lists and compile time programming? I'm, I'm going to show, I'm not going to do a lot of that because, um, because otherwise we'd be here all afternoon and it would be fun, but <laughs> I, have, I have a couple examples of it. Um, tuples are implemented as variadic templates and variadic templates are the tool you want to use when manipulating, when manip writing things that deal with tuples. In particular, that you, unless you want to deal with just a single, a single tuple type, like the, you know, the int, if you just want to deal with int float string, like the one I had in my earlier examples, you don't need variadic templates. But if you want to deal with tuples in general, variadic templates are going to be your friend. Um, you need to be, uh, you need to be very happy with them. Um, here's an example. Printing a tuple. How would you print a tuple? Let's just, just let's just brainstorm this for a second. You're given an arbitrary tuple, or if, for a tuple that contains an arbitrary list of types, or an arbitrary list of values of different types, how would you go about printing that? Rob. So you're gonna need two templates, one that's the zero case and the other that's gonna work down from the size of the, the tuple, and at each point you're gonna subtract one and, and recurse, and at each stage print one element. Right. What he said was you're going to you're going to need two um, you're going to need two um, two variadic template or two templates um, one of one one of which is the zero case and the other one is that starts at the size of the tuple and works backwards works down to um, zero. to zero um, and basically recurses There's the only the only problem with that is it prints the contents of the tuple backwards. You didn't say it needed to be in order. No, I didn't. I didn't. I'm, 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 you know, you're, we're suffering from feature creep here. Okay, I'm adding requirements later. Yes? So in that case, you would have a template that takes two parameters, uh, like the starting index and the tuple size, and then use partial specialized where they both have the same. Yeah. Or both is where it's n minus one and the size. Right. So he said you could, ha he said you could have, and I've forgotten your name, sorry. Sean. John, thank you. I've seen you around here all week. I've talked to you, and I forgot. I had forgotten your name. Um, yeah, you could have a specialization that took two in template parameters, um, one which was the current index and one which was the tuple size. Yeah, and and then you you work your way through front to back. Um, here's a sample implementation. Um, let's skip everything from here up for the moment. Okay, so um, this is. The, this is the outer template, okay? Type name dot 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 args. So we have a list of types, and this is an operator that takes an OStream, a tuple of those types, and what does it do? It prints a parenthesis, it calls this helper function print tuple, and then the close parenthesis. And so print tuple takes what? It takes the stream, the tuple, and a little structure up here, an empty structure that has a single template argument, or yeah, that has a single template argument which is a size t. It's a way of carrying around a, a compile time integer. And so, okay, so the main, this is the main template. And what does it do? It says it, it gets the tuple and a position. Okay, and what does it do? It prints out, gets the gets the called standard get on tuple size minus the position. That's how we go from front to back instead of back to front. And then just sends that to the stream. The stream is a template has templated blah 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 argument uh, operator. It knows if it's a string or an int or a float or whatever. It says, oh yeah, I can print that. 
and then it recurses on itself with pause minus one. And when we get down to one here, we just stop recursing. Now this stuff up here, I talked about this little um, this little stru struct that has a um, that carries an int. That's all it's there for is to carry a compile time int. Um, you need a forward declaration. It turns out. And um, and then I also specialize this to work with pair, because, well, in some of my examples I was printing tuples that contained pairs and they didn't actually print well, but for pair it was easy. You say, print first, second, and out, and we don't have to recurse for that. People happy with this? People, it got very quiet before I had hands going up. Um, we're going to see this kind of, see this a few times. Um, compile time integer sequences, compile time integer values in the next 20 minutes or so. Anyway, some examples. Int string float, da 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 da. We just print it out and we get print int string float. Um, more complicated example a tuple that contains an int that contains a tuple or a tuple that contains a pair and a tuple and another tuple over here and, this, and then you just you, see, you can just stream them to standard out and it all just works did you have a question back there or are you just adjusting the camera? just adjusting the camera okay okay so when you're picking out elements of a tuple, you need an index. Sometimes you need more than one index. Um, and so I had that little, that little type, that little class that um, took a single integer parameter, an empty struct that contained a single integer parameter at compile time. Indices is a similar thing, except it takes a sequence, zero or more integers. And the really cool thing about this is that you can um, you can use very very strange syntax, which I'll show you in just a second, um, to do amazing things. This kind of stuff is going to be part of C plus plus fourteen. I believe the paper number was N thirty four ninety three, but there was an updated post Bristol paper, um, but. Not a lot of changes from 3493. So here's an interesting function. Select a subset of a tuple. Okay? So if I have a tuple and I have a set of indices, I want a new tuple with just those indices selected and in the order that the indices like. And so I can do things like I can create a tuple with everything but the third element. I can create a tuple with the first, first, fourth, and third element, or whatever. So, but how does this work? And the, the key here is we have a tuple, a tuple of types and indices with a sequence of integers. And this magic thing here we call get on the index sequence and the tuple and expand it and you get a parameter pack. I don't know why this works. It works. It works really well and it makes all sorts of things possible. But I, I am not exactly sure why it, why it does this. So basically what we do is we take we take the input tuple T, we pick some number of elements out of it, burst it, we burst those elements into a parameter pack right here, which then gets passed to make tuple, which creates the new tuple for us, which we then return. And since I said that you know, a tuple is a compile time, container as well as a runtime data structure same thing but as a type function you have a set of a sequence of size t's 
and a tuple type, and you get out a new tuple type, which, which contains just the elements you want in the order you want. Now, select underscore. It's not the greatest name, but it works. Yes, behind you. Somewhat unrelated, but uh, mm -hmm. I wondered about passing this tuple and expanding those like this, you know, in case of get or mm -hmm. in this particular case. So if you had t as a R value reference, mm -hmm. and now you are passing t, you would probably use move or forward so, around that. But now it's a, if you use move for whatever reason, not mm -hmm. in case of get, get kind of non destructive kind of reloading mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? So now you are applying move on the same, when it expands, you're doing move on the same R value reference again and again, over and over, which is clearly wrong, right? I mean, you're not doing it here, it's just... Uh, move, calling move over and over again on an R value reference doesn't really do anything, because move doesn't actually, move is just a cast. Uh, right. The, qu the question was, if, if you, the question was, Basically, there's a complete lack of move semantics in this example, and I agree. If I was writing this for production code, I would probably there would probably be R value references and standard forwards throughout it. But he was worried about if the, if you could get into a, a loop where you were calling move over and over again on something. On Is the that same right? bit, yeah? On this get in this particular case will return the same thing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are moving it more than once. Mm -hmm. If get instead of get, there is some meaningful function, you know, does mm -hmm. a lot of things to T, then you are doing move over and over again. So it's kind of, you cannot move one variable more than once, you know. Um, but you can't, basically, the last thing you said, you can't move a variable more than once, except that, what that's what I'm trying to do. That's what he said was, it, it, when he finished up, the last thing he said, which is the thing I'm going to try to answer, is he said you can't call, you can't move a variable more than once. And that's true, but you can call std move on something more than once because std move doesn't actually move it. It just says to, it basically casts it to an R value reference so that when you assign it, if the thing you're assigning it to can take something by move construction or move assignment, it will do the move instead of a copy. And and I don't. I'm not sure where you're getting calling move more than more than once in here. I wonder if he's thinking about the parameter pack expansion mm -hmm. when you're calling make tuple, seeing that as multiple calls to get. Right. Is that part yeah, of your? If if you had so the same like, index more than once. So when you're when you're expanding the parameter pack, is mm -hmm. each index that's in your indices parameter pack. Right. Uh, is. Each index into its own independent get call right. on the tuple. Right. So, so if, if you get zero, one, and two in the parameter pack is, then you're going to get a get zero, a get one, and a get two. Right. That's so that's what happens here when this gets expanded. This gets expanded into one call to get for each index in in the size in in the is sequence. <laughs> and um, you were worried about the idea that if an index was in there more than once. You would. Uh, yeah, that would be one. Mm -hmm. If you had, if you had a move-only type in here, and I see what I see where you're going now. If you, if if you had in your source tuple, one of the things was a move-only type, and you had the index of that more than once in here, it would get moved from more than once. That's yes. Case of what I was thinking, but that, yeah. Okay. I see, I see how that could be a problem. Yes. By the way, it's perfectly valid to move from an object more than once. It just won't do what you expect. <laughs> <laughs> Sebastian, Sebastian pointed out that it's perfectly legal to move from an object more than once. It just probably does, isn't what you want to have happen. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, you had a different question. No uh, comment. That won't compile the select underscore. Uh, you, you tried to default instantiate the tuple that you get, and it might contain a type that is not default constructible. So you should probably use decal or something like that. Okay. Um, Sebastian's comment was that there are some cases where this will not compile if tuple contain one of the one of the types contained in the tuple is not default constructible, and I should use decalval instead. Yes, you are correct. So since the default constructor of tuple is not instantiated, it won't even try to instantiate the default constructors of the elements, correct? Because it's inside a decal type. Yeah. That was. 
So that, alignment might be true, yes. Um, the that was whether the default constructor gets deleted. <laughs> oh. See the saying that um, I don't know the rules. So if if the if the default constructor is deleted, is does this become is does this then fail to compile? The question is, is it deleted? Ah. If it is, then I think it's illegal. Okay, but this is definitely an unevaluated context in here. So, yeah, that they um, it's, his first comment was that he didn't think this was a problem because this is an unevaluated context here, and so the constructors of the elements of the tuple won't ever get called, which is quite possible. And actually, that, I was thinking about that when I made this slide. But then his, your comment was whether or not the default constructor for tuple is deleted, in which case it may be a problem. So I just looked it up, and it's kind of unclear. Right. So the default constructor for tuple says requires this default constru constructable t ti is true for all i. So every type in the tuple must be default constructed. It just doesn't say, okay, what does this require mean? So if <laughs> cause is violated, it gets strictly speaking, you probably get undefined behavior. Yes. So that's probably a bad idea to do it that way, but it probably depends on the actual library implementation, what really happens. OK, to summarize, um, the, the require, the the default constructor for tuple is not deleted, but it has a requires clause, which which requires that each of the elements in the um, in the tuple be default constructible. Okay, so if you were to in fact invoke this default constructor with something, that would be unbehind behavior. But again, I come back to this is an unevaluated context, and there, no code actually gets run here. So it may be that that's perfectly legal. I think I will run this by a couple of core, core friends of mine and say, what? <laughs> um, OK. So examples for using this code. Int string float, fine. Again. Slideware, OK? <coughs> needs, needs to be an F there. Won't compile. Um, make a new tuple with the old values, but turned around. OK, select T1 indices 0 to 1. So I would get int float string out of this. The old standby, the one I've been using all the way around. Um, make a new type. I'm using select underscore here, the compile time function, int float string 0 to 1 type. I'm calling it T5. Um, int string float. So I've, this new type I've made, T5, <coughs> 0, int first, then string, then float. So we're doing. Not the most compelling example, but it's Sorry, at least it fit on a slide. I'm looking at the libc pro plus. Oh. Not, nothing about you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the, I think that the point you raised actually is is more likely going to come out of core rather than um, than library implementations. I mean, different library implementations. You know, if it's undefined behavior, different library implementations will do different things. I just think that libc plus won't compile from looking at it. I okay. Um, Sebastian says that he thinks that in libc, if you're using libc++, it just won't compile, which is quite possible. Something for me to try. So in general, what can you do with this? Pretty much any transformation of a tuple or a tuple type where you can actually express it at compile time. Any kind of reorganization, removal of types, removal of element, duplication of elements, and so on. That you can do. Um, you have to, like I said, it has to be a compile time constant sequence of numbers. But other than that, I don't see really any limitations on here until you start getting into the limitations of your uh, that your standard library has imposed, which tend to be way up there. You know, I I used you know in that field name example I had earlier of 587th, I I picked that number, you know, as an indication that you should be able to put a lot of elements in a tuple. Um, why would you use it? That's a different question. But it's a very, very powerful set of manipulations. 
Um, okay, apply. Another interesting thing you can do with tuple. If you have a functor, functor being defined as something that, that implements the function call operator, and a tuple of values, um, call the functor with the elements of the tuple as parameters. Doing, conver you know, doing implicit conversions as necessary. Um, here is one that actually does all the forwarding and our value references and so on. Um, and this is very straightforward, right? Uh, we have our indices here. And so we, yeah, we burst it right here. Because the difference here is we forward, we forward it first. So we get the, all of the R value reference good, goodiness. But, and we forward the functor as well. But we call, it, call F with all the things burst. And, and the other thing is, one of the things in 39, sorry, not 39, 3493 that I talked about, is a set of functions for creating sequences like this automatically. And for, say, if you want, you know, 0 to n, say, or 0 to n minus 1 for a tuple of size n to generate automatically, then you don't have to specify it. I will mail these slides to Ray, and he'll put them up on the website. Other, other things that you can do with this. If you have a collection of functors, it doesn't have to be in a tuple, but it can be, and a collection of tuples, call each functor on the associated, uh, the associate, using the associated tuple as parameters and return a tuple of values. Because we're using tup we could use tuples here, the functions don't have to be, um, don't have to return, they all return the same type. If you have a tuple of functors, they can each be a different type. Um, you can do this each on their own thread. Mike Spartus of, um, of Symantec proposed actually doing exactly this as part of the standard. And people said, yeah, that's all really nice and so on, but does it belong in the standard library? Um, but yeah, you could you can just you know, build up a whole pile of work and then just say go, and they all run together, and then you get back just a, a collection of values, collection of results. Um, you can apply a functor to each element in the tuple and return the results of a tuple. Um, if you have a single functor, you know you may have to along the way you could wrap the wrap the values out of the tuple and boost any so that the functor just each sees a single type. But um, you do all sorts of things with this. I'm not 100% sure it's, you know, it's the best way to handle this kind of problem, but it's really interesting that, th that this kind of stuff is built into the standard library now. Any questions about this, about apply? You're saying apply is a function in um, No, apply is not in 11, or, and I, as far as I... I ooh. There was something like this proposed for 14, but I don't remember if it actually got in. It's not part of the 11 standard library. It may or may not be part of 14, but that's it. I copied this out of I copied this out of a working program, and and after I copied it out of a working program to fit it on the slide, the only thing I did was I removed STD blah blah blah, pretty much everywhere. I'm sorry? Indices. Indices, yeah, that's the, the thing I've been using here. Did I misspell indices? I did. Okay, so I changed that too. I implement, I introduced a typo along the way. Is the forward F strictly necessary? You know, that's a really good question. Is forward F strictly necessary? I'm not sure. But certainly, but calling forward is, is not an expensive operation. And um, I don't know. Anybody else have an opinion on this? Well, I would argue that if you're just passing the arguments along, you should call forward. He was actually talking about this part right here. Yeah. 
that one. Um, the other forward, I'm not so sure about. What, these? Yes. Oh, these you definitely want because, because you want to take the arguments that passed here and get perfect forwarding on them. Yeah. So what happens if you use an index multiple times? Aha. Uh -huh. The question was, what happens if you use an index multiple times? That, means, that would make that forward probably a bad idea. Because using an index multiple times and moving twice out of it. So you can't do both. Wait, 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 wait. Can't do this and this? No. You can't both use indexes multiple times and forward. OK, yes. Well, no, no, no. I, your comment is you can't use indexes multiple time and call forward. And I disagree. You can. It just won't work the way you want it to. <laughs> OK? But, in ge but you shouldn't. How's that? Okay. I agree. You shouldn't use indexes multiple times and call forward for the same reason we talked about a couple slides ago because you end up moving from some, your comment about moving from something from somewhere twice. Um, maybe just answering my own question. Uh, if f is a pointer with, I think, I don't know the right name for it, uh, r value this pointer, mm -hmm. in that case maybe forward makes sense because it keeps its r value-ness. Okay, so the, the comment was if f is a functor with an, uh, with an r value this pointer, then forward makes sense but it, because it preserves its r value-ness. I will have to think about that one. <laughs> okay, and we are just about out of time, and, we are j and by a curious coincidence, I'm just about out of slides. Um, there's a lot of things about tuple, a lot of, a lot of meat in such a simple data structure. It's pretty cool, the, all the, the things you can do with tuple. And you know, there's some stuff that is like, well, why would you do this? I don't know, but you know, when you're trying, you, basically the way I pick up a technology is I try to use it, and I keep using it, and I keep using it, and I learn what works, and I overuse it. And, I, and, and that's how I discover what doesn't work, or more, more usually, what doesn't work well. And so, by overusing things, by pushing the edges and finding out what things and things can't do, I discover, oh, okay, this is good practice. This, these are the kind of things that should be avoided. So I suggest that you guys go out and have fun with tuples because I'm sure there's more there that I haven't talked about. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.